In the first video in this series, we identified the origins, the foundational presupposition of God's total sovereignty, and then the five major points developed to summarize what we now know as Calvinism. Before we tackle the sovereignty issue, we need to grasp something crucial to all theology discussions. God told Israel to stick close to the words used in the Sinai Covenant and not drift off track in either direction by adding to or taking away from the wording of Scripture. Proverbs 30 verses 5 and 6 tells us that God's words are tested. Don't add to them. Paul encouraged Timothy to keep the standard of sound words learned from him. Revelation 22, 18 and 19 again warned against adding to or taking away from the words of this prophecy. In other words, it's a good idea and encourages unity and understanding for believers to all use a common language, the language the Spirit led the Bible writers to use to call Bible things by Bible words and phrases. Translators get involved, but it should only be to convey the words and concepts of Scripture in other languages as accurately and consistently as possible. However, when theologians formulate conceptions about God and reality for which they do not see biblical terminology and phraseology as sufficient, they tend to invent their own new lingo to represent their concepts. You may here have your first tip-off that they are not teaching biblical theology, but their own imagined Bibleosophy, a Bible philosophy hybrid. Keep your baloney detector handy and do what the Bereans did. Test what is being said against all of Scripture. Well, get out your exhaustive concordance and try to find where the Holy Spirit inspired Bible writers to mention God's total sovereignty, original sin, the fall of man, man's total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, or irresistible grace. You won't find them. These are terms that Augustinians and Calvinists invented to portray their concepts, which many have found at odds with biblical information. Perseverance of the saints is the only term found in the Bible, twice in the book of Revelation, but Calvinism defines it differently from what the Bible writers were saying. In theology, in fact in all rational logical thinking, foundational presuppositions definitions and concepts are absolutely crucial because conclusions logically flow from those foundational assumptions and definitions. The paradigm, the worldview or imagined mental picture we use to understand information can either lead us to a clear and accurate picture of all relevant evidence and reality or mislead us into embracing and promoting an ideological distortion of reality. Let's look closer at the foundational principle, the absolute total sovereignty of God. It is not uncommon when something bad happens for some believers to say, well, God is in control. But I wonder, what do they mean, and how does that sound to people who do not believe or understand what the Bible says about God and reality? Did God's control directly cause this bad thing to happen for some mysterious reason? Or did God allow it to occur, although it was not something he wanted to happen, and could have intervened to stop it? Has God allowed a lot of things to happen that he did not prefer because he wants a measure of human free will to play out, so that we show what is really in our hearts, and because their actions indict evil troublemakers? but also it provides an opportunity for growth, maturity, developing virtue, learning to sympathize with and help others, and to step forward to do something about limiting evil? What we need to come to grips with is understanding God's sovereignty in relation to the reality of events recorded in Scripture and unfolding around and in our own lives. I want to consider the sovereignty issue from two different perspectives both using the idea of an umbrella. Everything under the umbrella is what God has sovereignty over. Calvinists see one kind of thing under the umbrella, things that God exercises total power and control over, minute by minute, and causes, somewhat like a cosmic puppeteer. 
In the first video, we cited Calvin and a number of his ideological followers asserting that, from the beginning, God has had an all-inclusive eternal plan and made a decree encompassing every tiny detail in the universe and the minor details of life, from dust particles in the air to all of our sins. God's absolute sovereignty and decree cause all events to come about as they do. He rules with absolute power and nothing comes to pass apart from his eternal purpose. God's decision renders it certain that every person acts in a particular way, the way that God wills for them to act. God's foreordination and sovereign plan decides all that happens in the entire universe. Nothing happens by chance. God is behind everything, and he decides and causes all things to happen. Well, the ramifications of this notion of God's sovereignty are frightening. That means that every damaging hurricane and tornado was planned and guided by God. Every case of accident and disease, every act of murder, rape, child abuse, human trafficking, adultery, theft, false testimony, political corruption, etc., happened because God decided, decreed, foreordained, and predetermined that it would occur to selected individuals and was programmed into his all-encompassing plan of every tiny thing that would happen. Many years ago, I was browsing through a book at Baker Bookhouse's section of used books and ran across a comment saying that if God is like that, then he is a monster. So I read over the preceding pages to see what viewpoint the author was reacting to. It was Calvinism. Consider what that means for the biblical story to say that God decided, decreed, foreordained, predetermined, planned, willed, and caused every human to decide and do what God willed to happen. That means that God predetermined and caused Adam and Eve's rebellion in Eden, Cain's bad attitude, refusal to listen to God's advice, murder of his brother, departure from God's presence, and then descendants who would gradually become the corrupt and violent humanity that God destroyed with the flood. Moses attempts to excuse himself from returning to Egypt to lead Israel. Israel's rebellion against Moses, constant complaining about the food and wilderness, rejection of the Sinai covenant, and God's purpose for them, and desire to return to idolatry and Egypt. Israel's rejection of the priestly kingdom at Sinai, along with forgetting God and intermarrying with the Canaanites for over 300 years, the horrific sexual abuse of a Levite's concubine, and Israel's rejection of God's heavenly rule for an earthly monarchy like their pagan neighbors had. The idolatry Solomon planted in Jerusalem suburbs that then dominated the northern Israelite kingdom for 200 years and polluted Judah for 300 years. Israel's continual rejection of God's purpose and preference for things that God does not delight in. Israel's continual rejection of the prophets, for which God sent both Israelite kingdoms into exile in Assyria and Neo-Babylon. The majority of first century Judaism rejecting their Messiah, Jesus and many false prophets that deceived and troubled Israel and then created multiple divisions and false doctrines during the current New Covenant era, the Inquisition, Reformation warfare, and so on. Thus, Calvinists imply that God was orchestrating all of this rebellion and human evil secretly in the background, while outwardly telling Israel in the Sinai Covenant that his will for them was that they reject idolatry, not sin, keep his covenant and commandments, wishing they had a heart to fear and obey him, agonizing over Israel's rebellion and warning them to repent through the prophets, or judgment would fall, as though they were actually capable of obeying him, choosing and doing good, as well as evil. While Calvinists have painted themselves into a corner, they are committed to God's total sovereignty in the sense that he controls and causes everything that happens, including what people think and do. However, this makes God the ultimate source of human sin and evil, which they would like to move out from under the umbrella. That means humans have some free will, and God allows them to make real choices. 
But Calvinists don't like that either because they want God to be controlling everything. One writer plainly asserted that God has sovereignty over the earth only if he decrees, ordains, and foreordains everything so that the decisions and wills of men do not determine anything that occurs. If something happens that God has not decreed or ordained, then that part of the universe is outside of God's control and power. For if God has not foreordained all things, especially the decisions of men, then what happens on the earth is determined by the wills of men and not the will of God. Calvinists reject the idea that things on earth can happen because of human wills, to which God reacts, but the Bible clearly teaches that this happens. In Deuteronomy 28, 1-14, we have a summary of the impressive perks that God offered to Israel for covenant faithfulness on their part. On the other hand, Deuteronomy 28, 15-68 lists the curses they would receive for persistent unfaithfulness and rebellion. These Sinai covenant blessings and curses were clearly an expression of how God would deal with Israel, depending on their choices, and Israel's history reveals that they tended to rebel and receive the curses. In Jeremiah 18, verses 7 through 10, as the Babylonian conquest and exile were fast approaching because of Judah's persistent covenant unfaithfulness, we are told that God plans destruction or blessing, but changes his mind in reaction to what nations do. In Jeremiah 7.3 and 26.13, Judah was told that if they repented and listened, God would change his mind and they could remain in Jerusalem. But they refused, so God sent the Neo-Babylonian Empire to conquer and exile them for 70 years. In Matthew 23.37, Jesus expressed that he wanted to gather and protect Israel many times, but it did not happen because they were unwilling. Calvinism is simply wrong. God does allow some things to occur on earth because of human will and decisions, and then he reacts to them. While Calvinists are committed to sovereignty as cosmic micromanagement, According to their view, a man has sovereignty over his business only if he micromanages all of the thoughts and actions of his employees. Thus, if anything occurs that is not what he wants to happen, like an employee daydreaming or loafing or stealing money from the cash register, or an employee has a good idea that works, then the store is somehow outside the man's control and power. No, that's ridiculous. The owner can know of problems and let them continue for a while to see all who are involved, or incorporate an employee's good idea, and then discipline or reward employees whenever he chooses, because he does have control, power, and sovereignty over his business. That brings us to the larger and more traditional concept of sovereignty that makes more sense. There is a more traditional concept of sovereignty that better fits what we find in the Bible, final authority, and it allows for two kinds of things under the umbrella of God's sovereignty. There are things God directly wills and causes to occur, and there are things God allows creatures to do, and then he deals with them later. God created the universe. He exempted Enoch from physical death. He sent the Great Flood. He forced post-flood humanity to scatter by dividing the original language at Babel. Then there was the ten plagues on Egypt. He saved Jerusalem from a premature Assyrian assault. He brought a few dead people back to life and had a wounded Messiah deal with sin, his first and second comings, and final judgment. Well, God has allowed a lot of human rebellion to unfold. But there are three cases when God forced chosen servants to do his will. First, God promised the patriarchs that he would make their descendants, the Hebrews or Israelites, a nation in Canaan and bring the Messiah from their midst, after which his blessings would be offered to all nations. But from Exodus through Nehemiah, it is obvious that the Hebrews were more interested in Egypt's food, Canaanite idolatry, and then an earthly monarchy like their pagan neighbors. 
than cooperating with God's purpose. However, God fulfilled his promises to the patriarchs and continued working with the Hebrews until Jesus arrived. Second, Moses did not want to return to Egypt to lead the people to Canaan, and he offered excuses hoping God would let him out of it. But God did not, because he was specially trained and prepared for the task. Third, God wanted Jonah to warn Nineveh, but he wasn't interested and preferred a Mediterranean cruise in the other direction. So God intervened with a storm, Jonah auditioned as fish food, and realized there are worse places to wind up in than Nineveh. God had Paul picked out as his special apostle to the Gentile world and bluntly got his attention. But Paul really did want to cooperate with God's will, adjusted his thinking, and accepted the mission. There are things in which God allows creatures to act and deals with them later. The natural order is semi-autonomous. Weather patterns and seasons occur by discernible interacting forces that we can identify and predict. God created angelic and image creatures with limited responsible freedom, capable of submission and obedience, as well as rebellion and disobedience. Sometimes humans rebel with hard hearts. Sometimes they obey half-heartedly. And sometimes they obey with a whole heart. God has left men alone to see what they will do, and he has let the nations go their own way for a while. Thus, it is valid to urge humans to seek God and turn away from sin, because we were created and still are able to make those choices. Perhaps God truly does want all to be saved and had Jesus die for the sins of all, but has given us a voice in whether or not we seek out and embrace his offered mercy or judgment. He can identify some divinely set conditional responses for humans seeking salvation. It is possible for believers to stop believing, change their worldview, and fall away. And this is why prophets, Jesus, and his apostles warned people of that danger. Rather than minute-by-minute -minute micromanagement, God's sovereignty is exercised later by rewarding obedient servants and punishing rebels at the end in a final judgment that takes into account their thoughts, words, and deeds. This second concept of sovereignty is much more in harmony with everything that I see in Scripture. Central to the Calvinistic view is that God controls all from the beginning with an all-encompassing plan and original decree that scripted everything that would occur as the universe unfolds. Several passages are often cited to support the notion of a highly detailed predetermined plan for everything that occurs. In Isaiah 46.10, God declares, Nagad, to announce or to inform the end from the beginning. God is aware of and declares, announces, reveals, and makes known how things will end from the beginning. It says nothing about God scripting and causing every little detail of what happens between the beginning and the end. Psalm 33, 10 and 11 speaks of God nullifying or frustrating the plans of the nations and his purpose standing forever. Well, God has frustrated human plans as at Babel, terminating the Assyrian and Neo-Babylonian empires when they went off course and the leaders in Jerusalem who failed to recognize Jesus as Messiah. However, he has also allowed humans to frustrate his plans temporarily. Israel's history contains many examples. Through the Law and Prophets, God tried to prepare Israel for the Messiah and a new covenant, but he allowed the rabbis to mislead first century Judaism so that they were no longer expecting a wounded Messiah or his blessings offered to all nations. God has caused his purpose to come to pass, but things would be better if those he chose had cooperated with his plans. Psalm 135.6, God does what he pleases, but that seems to include allowing people to rebel and miss out on his blessings. In Ephesians 1.11, said that God has worked out all things according to his will. But we know there are some things that did not play out as smoothly as he intended. 
Israel should have known that God would move them to Canaan 400 years after they entered Egypt. But the generation Moses tried to lead had apparently forgotten and did not want to leave Egypt. Israel caused their 40 years of wandering. God wanted Israel to have a heart to obey him, but he did not miraculously change their hearts so that they did what he wanted. God accomplished his purpose, but the Bible notes examples of people who rejected his purpose for them. Human history does not look like a divine puppet show in which all people do exactly what God has expressed as his will for them. Did the God who claims to want all saved cause the whole world to lie in the power of the evil one? Did the God who expressed his desire that Israel would fear and obey him and be blessed really cause Israel to be rebellious, walk in the wrong way, follow their own thoughts, provoke him, offer unholy sacrifices, eat forbidden food, look down on others, and choose things that he hates? The only sensible answer is that God has allowed a measure of human free will to play out, called Israel for a specific purpose, but they were persistently not interested. The Jews were offered the gospel first, but when they rejected Jesus and the gospel message, they judged themselves unworthy of eternal life. Well, does God plan and accomplish certain things? Yes, he has planned certain things. He promised the patriarchs blessings and protection so that their descendants would be made a nation in Canaan, and then Messiah's blessings would be offered to all nations, and all of that came to pass. Scripture identifies God's plan for the tabernacle, like blueprints, against Assyria for overreaching his intentions for their punishment of rebellious Israel bringing Neo-Babylon against Judah for persistent rebellion and Edom, plus dealing with Neo-Babylon after they went off track and bringing the Messiah into the world to suffer for human sin. What I do not see in Scripture is evidence that God has planned out the movement of every dust particle, human thought, action, and sin. God created a semi-autonomous natural order that normally takes care of wind and dust particles, he has intervened in the natural order, but he usually allows it to provide sunshine and rain on the righteous and the unrighteous, and he has permitted nations to go their own ways while still providing them with rain and fruitful harvests. Calvinists tend to equate foreknowledge with foreordination. These words do not mean the same thing. To foreknow means to know or be aware of something before it occurs or others know about it. To foreordain means to ordain or determine or cause what will happen before it happens. To equate awareness with causation is nonsense. God and his knowledge are not limited by space and time as we are. Press secretaries know what will happen before they announce it publicly. They foreknow, but they usually do not play any role in formulating new policies or decisions. Even we can foreknow something before others without causing it to occur. Watch a movie that you've already seen with someone who has not yet seen it. Relative to them, you have actual foreknowledge of what will happen without causing any of it. Your foreknowledge of the plot and unfolding action does not mean that you foreordained, predetermined, controlled, or caused any of the story, the dialogue and action to unfold as it does. That was determined by the scriptwriter, producer, director, and actors. You did not play any part in causing any of the movie to unfold as it does, but you have a real knowledge of what happens prior to the first-time viewer. In the same way, God, not limited by space and time boundaries that we have, can foreknow what people will think and do without causing it. The Bible tells us that Yahweh is not like the gods of the other nations. Yahweh is the all-powerful, God Almighty, El Shaddai, creator and king, not a whimsical cosmic micromanager. Rather than power, the biblical God portrayed himself as a faithful covenant maker and keeper and his self-expressed leading characteristics are love, patience, mercy, and covenant faithfulness. Patience implies allowing some things to occur and continue for a while that are not what you prefer. 
Rather than a cosmic puppeteer, Yahweh is a cosmic parent, or father, who took the risk of creating image creatures capable of rebellion in the hope that they would want to be in his family. We take the same risk when we decide to have children. The real question is how God exercises his sovereign authority. Does the Bible portray God as exercising total control, manipulation, and micromanagement over the thoughts and actions of people so that everything happens in perfect harmony with his expressed will? Or does God express his will and really wants his people to obey and cooperate with it, but allows creatures to make real choices about seeking, obeying, cooperating with his will, or rebelling and eventually being held accountable for their bad choices and actions? The Bible records that angelic beings can and have rebelled against God, even setting up a rival dominion. God's own image creatures have a long history of being ornery and easily suckered by temptations in the areas of sexual immorality, greed, political, social power. In Israel's history, we see God patiently dealing with a perpetually rebellious people who did not want to fulfill the role he intended for them. The Bible also tells us that God's sovereignty will deal with all of his rebellious creatures at a later time of judgment. While Paul maintained the Old Testament view that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, he did not view humans as puppets dancing on the end of God's micromanaging cosmic strings of fate. Many have been duped into serving Satan by following their fleshly lusts because of the surrounding cultural and spiritual influences, futile thinking, darkened understanding, ignorance, and by deception are held captive to do Satan's will. John said that the world effectively lies in the power of the evil one. It all belongs to God, but he has allowed Satan's corrupting influence to spread widely, and humans have had to navigate and choose between two dominions and make their own responsible choices about which one they will give their loyalty to. Paul was called as an apostle to recruit Gentiles to leave the dominion of Satan and switch their allegiance to God's dominion. By denying humans responsible freedom, Calvinists pretend to be defending God's sovereignty, but they are defending their own imagined philosophical concept of sovereignty rather than what we see playing out in the Bible. The Bible portrays God as having ultimate authority over his universe, for he does what he pleases, and no created being can thwart his plans. But he is also patient and has allowed creaturely disobedience to play out over a period of time. I'm going to say two things that I hope the listener has ears to hear and consider. Number one, nobody can rob God of his sovereignty, for he created and owns the universe. He can intervene whenever and however he chooses. All souls belong to him. The universe will end when he is ready, and all living beings will be held accountable for their choices and actions at a final judgment. Number two, viewing humans as making real moral and spiritual choices does not rob God of his sovereignty if he is the author and source of limited human freedom and abilities. Why is God grieved or angry at human evil? If God ordained that all of Adam's descendants would be inherently damaged so that doing evil is their only option, then why does God grieve and agonize over it and wish that rebels would repent and turn to him, when Calvinists also assert that humans are unable to repent unless first inwardly miraculously manipulated by God to do so, and then only those God has already elected will receive that? It makes no sense to put humans in a condition where evil is their only real option and then express anguish when they do evil. Note where prophets portray God as agonizing or grieving over human evil. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I surrender you, O Israel? My heart is turned over within me, all my compassions are kindled. Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a delightful child? Indeed, 
as often as I have spoken against him, I certainly still remember him. Therefore my heart yearns for him. I will surely have mercy on him, declares the Lord. Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, declares the Lord God. Repent and turn, from all your transgressions, lest iniquity be your ruin. Cast away from you, all the transgressions, that you have committed, and make yourselves a new heart, and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God, so turn, and live. Ezekiel 18 presents a powerful argument on these ideas. All souls belong to God, and guilt is not inherited from previous generations, but arises from each person's own sin. Three generations are noted, with each looking and considering at the actions of the previous one, and then making decisions about their own behavior. Rather than foreordain to do evil, God expresses his wish that Israel would repent and turn, cast away their transgressions, make yourselves a new heart, turn and live. Did you notice that it was Israel's responsibility to make those needed changes? which implies that they were able to do so. Are Calvinists implying that God was just pretending to be grieved at human sin and cultural decline, when in fact he had decreed, planned, and ordained all of this from the beginning, and put all of Adam's descendants in a condition where they are so damaged and depraved that they are unable to seek God, respond to God, or repent? If God actually decreed, planned, and ordained all of this, then why is he angry at sinners for acting out what he has ultimately determined as the only course of action left open to them? Calvinists assert that God ordained that Adam's sin would corrupt all of his descendants so that they are unable to choose or do good. But then God expresses anger at people for doing their only option? Paul rejected the hypothetical objection in Romans 3, 5 through 8. If our sin makes God look better, why does he judge us for being sinners? And in Romans 9.19, why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? Well, the fact that God can be glorified even when humans rebel against him does not prove that God ordained the rebellion, but that he can sometimes turn our freely chosen rebellion into positives. Although freely chosen obedience and submission will even more powerfully glorify him. Rather than human rebellion glorifying God, Scripture says that Israel's rebellion made God look bad to surrounding nations. Paul rejected the argument that God is somehow behind human rebellion, or that humans cannot resist God's will. For humans have been resisting God's will since Eden. Adam and Eve, Cain, humanity before the flood, Noah's descendants that refused to disperse and chose to remain together in the plains of Shinar until he intervened at Babel and forced them to separate, Israel for most of their 1,400-year history, and people who reject the gospel or claim to be Christians but continue in sinful lifestyles. That's who resists his will. There's plenty of that still going on in our time. But the sovereign God has obviously chosen to allow that to happen for a while. We will consider this further with unconditional election, but if God by his own sovereign decree determined at the beginning and chose which individuals would be saved and condemned without any foreknowledge or consideration of human choices and actions, then how can we take seriously the biblical claims that God actually wants all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, and is not wishing that any perish but for all to come to repentance? Does God really want all to be saved? Well, not if at the beginning he whimsically chose some and rejected others before and apart from their choices and actions. And doesn't such a whimsical choice of some over others make God a respecter of persons and showing partiality? When scripture tells us that God does not want his image creatures to treat others with partiality and judgment, Jesus was known for not showing partiality and God does not show partiality, but welcomes all who fear him and do what is right. 
God has revealed his will in Scripture. A lot of God's will was revealed to the Hebrews in the Torah, Sinai Covenant, prophets, and wisdom literature. Even more has been revealed through Jesus and his apostles. However, what is the point of God revealing his will to people if he ordained that they would inherit a corrupted, damaged nature that's incapable of understanding Scripture, seeking God, or responding to any of it? There are some apparent inconsistencies between Scripture and Calvinistic ideology, such as asserting that God pre-selected some for salvation over others while claiming to want all saved, and choosing some for salvation and condemnation without considering their choices and actions, but then repeatedly portraying salvation and judgment based on each person's thoughts, deeds, and words. Calvinists dismiss problems like this as beyond our understanding and ascribe them to the allegedly more comprehensive and mysterious secret will of God. While there have always been revealed and secret things, it violates the integrity of God's nature if his secret will is contrary and contradictory to his revealed will. The foundational error of Calvinism was in approaching the Hebrew Bible from a Greek worldview. So instead of seeing God as a loving and faithful covenant maker and keeper, they see God as all about power and control. Rather than seeing man as God's special responsible image creature, they see animated inferior matter, so damaged and evil that they are unable to seek or respond to God. Calvin's mentor, Augustine, asserted that the human will is not even capable of independent activity. However, elsewhere they claim that God has left the unregenerate to freely choose their evil deeds. In fact, they will even admit that Adam's descendants are still free to make choices, but they do not have the ability to choose good over evil. Isn't that like voting in Russia, where there's only one candidate? There is no freedom to choose when there is only one option. On the other hand, God's sovereignty as an umbrella with two kinds of things under it solves a number of Bible problems. Under God's sovereignty, he directly causes some things to happen, and he also allows other things to unfold due to the limited freedom he has granted to his creatures, patiently waiting until he determines the proper time to bring judgment. Israel had to wait in Egypt for 400 years until God determined the appropriate time to judge the sins of the Canaanites, and the prophet Habakkuk was frustrated that God had allowed rebellion to continue so long within Judah, then was confused as to why he would use Neo-Babylon as his agent of judgment. At the end and final judgment, God's ultimate sovereignty over everything will reward the obedient and punish rebels. This keeps God sovereign over everything, allows him freedom to act as he wishes, but also takes seriously what appears to be divinely granted limited human freedom, to make real moral choices of good and evil, so that God is not causing humans to think, say, or do evil things. The serpent and human choices are sufficient to account for evil, but God holds sovereignty, final authority, over everything. Thank you.